Live region, human Litsky, Ismail, just around the corner. Hello, 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 everyone. Hi, good evening, good evening. Uh, hello from Butcher Poltava. Hello from Odessa, fantastic. Vini to Kiev. Hello, everyone. Odessa again. Wow, very fast. Ismail Truskavets in the mountains. Good to see you. Hello from Kiev, Angelina. Good to see you too. Zaporizhia, Rivna, Ternopil. Hello from Kiev. Hi. Okay. Uh, hello, Vinitsa. You're shouting at me with your big letters, you know. Uh, Lviv, hello. Hello, Irina. Okay. Hi, Lviv. Hello from Odessa, Helen. Good to see you. Uh -huh. Hello, Tatiana. Hello to you too. Jitome, hello from Odessa, nice to see you, nice to see you too. Well, I can't see you, but uh, good to hear from you. Uh, Chekasi, Kiev, glad to see you again. Great to see you too. Okay, Odessa, hello, Margarita. Uh, hello from Ternopil, Kharkiv, Kropivnitsky, my favorite name, because it's so long. Boris Paul, again in big letters. How's the weather where you are? It's sunny in Odessa, quite warm. Not very warm, but quite warm. I hope it's good where you are too. Okay, lots of love from Kiev. Fantastic, Ludmilla. Lots of love from Odessa. And nice to see you, Svetlana. Good to see you too. Well, good to hear from you. It's rainy in Ismail, really? Just around the corner and it's raining. I'm sorry about that. Uh, rainy in Truskaviets? Wow. Donetsk region. Hello, Donetsk region. Cloudy, rainy. Well, it seems like I'm lucky, you know, in Odessa. Uh, Sambir, hello. Sunny, good. Warm and sunny, excellent. Uh, Nikolaev, hi Nikolaev. Nice city, been there a few times. Good to hear from you. Lutsk, raining in Odessa a few hours ago. Really? I didn't notice, you know. Um, Zoya Odessa, hello Zoya Odessa again. Good to see you. Oh, cloudy and thunder in Jitomi. Okay. Um, Jana, good to see you as well in Zaporizhia. Hi from Kiev, Natalia. Ivan Frankovsky, Ivan Frankovsky, great. Dnipro, Kiev, fantastic. Nizhin again, Kropivnitsky. <sighs> Difficult to say that one. Kharkiv, hello. Kaniv, hi. Kimonitsky again, also not the easiest to say, but I'm trying my best. Nice to see you. Nice to hear from you, Katerina. Okay. Hope you're all safe. Oh, hello from Odessa. Great. Uh, Irina. Ala Odessa. Hello, Ala. Is today tea or water? Good question. It's water, I'm afraid, you know. Mm -hmm. But I do have also some uh, Lipton. Where is it? Here it is. Some Lipton iced tea as well, you know, just in case. Chekasi. Uh, yes, it is cool that uh, it's raining because farmers are waiting for rain. Yes, that's very true. I read that as well. The rivers are quite low, yeah, so they need rain. Okay. Hello from Odessa, Elena. Hello to you too. Ha, ha, halik. Hassan, never been, but would like to go. Tanyopil. Uh -huh. Mena is greeting me. Hello, Mena. Okay, hot today with Katerina. Yeah, good. Cheers. Uh -huh. How many people are usually presented? I'm not quite sure what you mean. Uh, hello from Venice, Lviv. Uh, Privet from Irpinia. Mm -hmm. Hello. Uh, Bakhmut greets me. Fantastic. And I greet Bakhmut. Bogoslav. The weather is perfect in Kiev. You're very lucky. I am the best, really. Uh, hello from Bob Robs. Yeah, whoa. Uh, difficult to say. Odessa. Hassan Slaviansk. Rivne. Whoa. That's a new one. Vilnjansk. Hello to Vilnjansk. Kharkiv again. Oh, Bola. Again, great name. Lviv greets me and I greet Lviv. Good to see you. Okay. Elena from Kiev. Uh, <laughs> Ismail uh, says hello and I say hello to uh, Ismail and hello to, to Kiev. Oh, sorry, to Kharkiv, to Olga in Kharkiv. Zaporozhye. Hello, Zaporozhye. Hello, Natalia. Lviv is cloudy, but no rain yet. I'm sure it's on the way. My um, <laughs> Ukrainian is great. Thank you. I think you're uh, flattering me a bit. Uh, Vishneva, Cherry Town. Oh, yeah, Vishneva. Yeah. Hello from Odessa. Hello, Roslana, Kiev. I'm a good reader. I try my best. You know? uh, Slavyansk, Nizhin, Kharkiv, Kiev, Poltava, Volin, Kiev, Kharkiv. Good to see. Oh, there's a new one. Vatu, Vatutina. Mm, interesting. No idea where that is, but I'm sure it's lovely. 
It's great to see so many people here from all different parts of Ukraine and maybe outside of Ukraine. Who knows? Good afternoon to you, Irina, too. Poltava, hi. Never been to Poltava, but would love to visit one day. Uh, Ivan Frankivsk, I've been there, but only for the train station. Enhador, uh, wow, goodness me. Pavlograd, hello. Kiev, Kiev, hi. I'm the best bro. Flattery again. Glad to see you too, Ludmilla. Hello from Bravari. Hello from Ismail. Odessa Mechnikov University. Katerina. Hi, Katerina. Good to see you. Yeah. Uh, I should visit the Poltava. I know I should. I know I should. Hello from Stri. Stri. Difficult again. Hello, Stri. Harkiv. Hi. Harkiv. Zhidavich Lviv region. Okay, great. Kolomia. Hello, Natalia from Odessa. Lutsk is greeting me. I'm greeting Lutsk. Hi. Grinchenko University says hello. And I say hello to Grinchenko University as well. Uh, oh, that's a new one. Veliki Lubin. Hello. Krop. <laughs> My favorite one, Kropotnitsky. Nice to see you too. Uh, Trade and Economics University. Hello, Oksana. Uh, by the way, how do I like Ukraine? I love Ukraine. That's why I'm still here after all this time, you know. Hello, Tanyopil. <laughs> Mizoch. Novur. Oh, that's a difficult one. Uh, nice to see me. Okay, Shargara. Chernomorsk, just around the corner. Lovely, sunny Chernomorsk. Hello. Hello from Odessa. Hello, Elena. Nice to see you too, Irina. Hello, Ivan Frankos. Best wishes from Vinita and best wishes to you too. National Fine Arts and Architecture Academy. Fantastic place. Hello, Victoria. Novi Rosdil in Lviv. Uh -huh. Nice to see you too, Roslana. Hello from Kharkiv. Okay, guys, we're going to be starting in about two minutes. Just waiting to see if everyone's coming in and they switched on their sound and their video. Hello from Kharkiv. Dnipro. Hi, Dnipro. I've never been to Dnipro, but I'd like to go. Been to Kharkiv a few times. Nice city, like Kharkiv. Sokol, nice to see you, Sokol. Chernigiv, Yuzhny, again, just around the corner. But I've never been to Yuzhny. Can you believe it? Yeah. Which cities have I visited in Ukraine? Quite a lot. I can pass my geography exam. Uh Ukraine University, hello. Oh, Ternopil Pedagogical University. Nice to see you too, guys. Okay, Transcarpathia sounds so exotic. Nice to see you too. Butcher always uh, reminds me of meat, <laughs> that name, Butcher. Kamonitsky, uh, Korostyshiv. Okay, where am I from? I'm from England. Uh, usually is the best, I'm sure it is. Hello, Odessa. Hello, Rima in Odessa. Odessa Mechnikov. Hello, Elena. Nice to see you. Attending my seminar in Kiev. Fantastic, Natalia. I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah. My Ukraine is better day by day because of reading all these messages. That's why. Hello from Ismail, just around the corner. As you said, yes, I've been there once. I would love to go back. Very nice place, Ismail. Actually, I went there at the end of April, I remember, and the weather was very warm. Yeah, I've been to Lviv quite a few times. Fantastic city. National University of Construction and Architecture. Nice to see you, Svetlana. Yeah. Kiev Polytechnic Institute is also greeting me. Hi, Kiev Polytechnic. Nijin, very nice Ukrainian accent. Uh, I try my best, you know. Uh, okay, I'll be glad to visit you too, uh, Dina. Uh, Boris Pearl, very nice airport. <laughs> That's what I know about Boris Pearl. Uh, ancient Chernihiv, never been to Chernihiv, but would love to. Yeah. Village of Chorno Platova in Sumy, fantastic. Sumy, never been to Sumy. Krivirik, never been there, but would love to go. Uh, are you in Ukraine firstly? No, I've been here a long time, 10 years, you know. Uh, Luzanivka, Luzanivka. Okay, fantastic, Irina. Yeah. Okay, let's make a start, guys. Okay. Um, it's great to see so many people here again. Fantastic from everywhere, telling me about your weather which is always very interesting. Glad to know there's some rain about for the rivers and for the farmers, okay? So today it's part of the ongoing series of um, webinars by Dinternal Education, okay? Uh, I hope you came to mine a couple of weeks ago on Go Getter. I'll be doing one in two weeks again about Speak Out um, course book. Um, but today we're going to talk about um, the lexical approach. What is it? And does it work? Okay. Um, so you'll be hearing all about that. I'm sure you know something. I hope I'll tell you a little bit more. Just to tell you a bit more about myself, my name is Graham. I'm the director of the London School of English here in Odessa. 
and I'm also employed by uh, Dintanal Education as a methodologist, and I'm also a CELTA tutor in, in the summers here in Odessa. I've been in Odessa 10 and a half, nearly 11 years, and have, yeah, so uh, that's why I can read a little bit <laughs> in Ukrainian, yeah, but I'm originally from a small, smallish city called Hull in Yorkshire in, in England, okay? Um, all right, so uh, just before we start, a very important piece of information. For attending and registering for this seminar, uh, you will get your certificate online. Uh, don't worry if it's not there tomorrow. Uh, we say it will be within a week after this uh, webinar, but we hope it will be in the next few days, okay? Um, so please be patient because we have a, quite a lot to send out, yeah? All right, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. So when I, this is a picture of when I first started uh, teaching. Okay, uh, a long time ago when dinosaurs roamed the planet, okay. Uh, actually, it was 22 years ago, 1998, I did my first teaching job um, uh, in Poland, in Warsaw, in Poland, a um, long time ago. And of course, things were a little bit different in the teaching world then, okay. For example, when I was teaching uh, Lexis from course books, we had something like this in the course books, okay. So as you can see there, we had... So the, the, the Lexis was presented um, in a lexical set, so everything was connected to um, one theme. Here you can probably see with barbecue, celebrate, dancing, it's all connected to celebrations, okay? But as you can also see, there was just individual words presented in the box, and there was no context, okay? The, the language is just presented in a box, okay? We're gonna look a bit later on uh, how uh, roadmap, uh, Pearson book um, presents language now and how it's changed from those days when the dinosaurs were uh, knocking me over in the streets of Warsaw. Yeah? So um, now, before I started teaching, but uh, um, I didn't know about it at the time, there, were, there had been a book produced by Michael Lewis uh, and it became quite famous in the English teaching world. It was called The Lexical Approach. Before then, there had been a, a large focus on teaching English with grammar as the main priority. But this book uh, sort of oof, rubbish that idea to some extent and thought and brought in concepts for teaching, uh, in sort of focusing on Lexis, on vocabulary more than on the, the grammar. And it was very interesting, maybe not straight away in the 90s, but as time went on in the 2000s and even now, people still look upon this book uh, as a very important book um, in the history of ELT teaching. Now, because uh, not everyone understood completely what Michael Lewis meant by teaching Lexis, okay? Um, he did another book, he wrote another book, and four years later we had Implementing the Lexical Approach. So this was a bit of a repetition of what he said in his previous book, but it was also looking at ways in which you can implement or use this approach in the classroom. So it's much more practical. Yeah, it's a book I strongly recommend uh, that you to buy or to get hold of because it has lots of interesting ideas which we'll be talking a bit about today, okay? So, what is the lexical approach then? What did Lewis mean when he said the lexical approach? What do you think? Write me in a few uh, answers here. We're still saying hello, it's great to see you too. What do you think, what is the lexical approach exactly? Excellent, words, collocations, idioms, more speaking, yeah? Vocabulary use based on the context, good. Uh, team words, okay. Speaking, maintain vocabulary, methods of teaching vocabulary. Hello, yeah. Using collocations, Lexis, learning vocabulary, vocabulary. Less grammar, more words, exactly, good. Communication, phrasals, speaking, uh -huh. vocab, words, vocab. Oh, all very, very good answers, guys, fantastic, okay. And you really, yeah, you've really nailed it there, excellent, okay. so. This is what I've got though, okay? Now, as you can see, I've got some ideas here, but unfortunately, I forgot to put some of the letters, okay? Can you please write in again? What do you think uh, the missing words are here? Lexis, looks like it, pretty good. Uh-huh, Lexix, uh-huh. <laughs> what else, chunks, very good, yes, uh-huh. A choice. Massive exposure. Excellent. Very good. You seem to have read this book, maybe. Yeah. Hello. I'm not sure that's one of them, but hi. 
memorable, memorizing. Oh, uh -huh. good. Okay. Memorization. Oh, excellent. Frequency. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh -huh. All right, Lexis, uh -huh. frequency. Mm -hmm. Okay, fantastic, guys. It seems like we have more or less the same ideas. So, the lexical approach, just to sum up some of the main features of it. So, as I mentioned before, the emphasis on grammar uh, went, and there was more an emphasis on Lexis. That's why it's called the lexical approach, yeah? And there was chunks of language, okay? An emphasis on, so not just individual words, but on chunks, so maybe four words, three words, five words, okay, in a row. Because as you know, when we speak, we rarely speak in individual words, unless you're a teenager and speaking to your parents. Um, but we usually speak in, in chunks, you know, one chunk, then another chunk, then another chunk. Memorization, it was uh, also important. You had to, all of the chunks that were being taught, uh, you had to remember them, okay? That was important, of course, uh, for speaking fluently. Word frequency, now this was interesting. So before um, computers <laughs> and what we call corpus studies, corpus studies basically uh, was recording uh, how much native speakers were using certain words and collocations and fixed phrases. And with this information, course book writers could then start to think about what they should include, which language they should include in their books in their course books. Before that, the course book writers, I think, were just using what language they enjoyed using or which they used themselves, but maybe it wasn't very frequent. There's some words that I use all the time, but I know that other people don't. So corpus studies really uh, um, focused on what words were frequently used in the English language, and then you could include them at lower levels, yeah? So elementary and pre-intermediate would have more frequent words. Rules were out, sorry, grammarians, and patterns were in, patterns of language, okay? Uh, then we had noticing, which we'll talk more about later, but basically noticing the patterns of language. You could call it consciousness uh, raising, uh, awareness raising. So students would be asked to look at all the collocations, uh, all the patterns in a text. Okay. Input and exposure. So this was all about, Lewis said, what's very important here is the input. I mean, like uh, students should be reading a lot of texts and noticing how the language is used. Authentic texts were pretty important, and also listening as well, okay? So that was very important. Students needed to have a lot of language going into them, okay? So these were the key features, really, of, of the lexical approach, okay? And then we had some famous, uh, well, in my world anyway, famous quotes uh, from Lewis himself and from John Sinclair. The first one, as you can see, more meaning is carried by Lexis than by grammatical structure. Mm -hmm. Very famous quote from Mr. Lewis in his book. And uh, John Sinclair said a few years later, a lexical mistake often causes more misunderstanding while, uh, causes misunderstanding while a grammatical mistake rarely does. So what do you think, guys? Do you agree or disagree with these quotes? Uh, well, a lot of people saying they agree, even strongly agree, it seems. Mm -hmm. 50-50, interesting, yeah, mm -hmm. good, yeah, okay, so a lot of people saying, yeah, agree, even a thumbs up, excellent, uh -huh. okay, I like grammar, I like grammar too, uh, don't worry about it, especially two, yeah, mm -hmm. agree with the second one, okay, oh, but somebody disagrees with the second one, language is grammatized Lexis, fantastic, another famous quote from, from Lewis, I believe, you know, agree for sure, well, what I said, is I think they're both more or less true, okay? I don't ever like to say, if you're ever in one of my classes, I never say a rule is 100% because usually you can catch me out later, yeah, when it's not 100%. So I'm saying it's more or less true, okay? Um, so for example, uh, this uh, mistake, a typical mistake of perhaps a pre-intermediate learner, um, when they're sort of their language is, is in a state of flux, is it just changing all the time? And they say, what you do last night? And the teacher goes, oh, God, how many times? You know, what did you do? But anyway, this teacher and the listeners can still understand what the speaker means by this. You know, what you do last night? Yeah, well, I uh, went home, I read my book played with my daughter, you know, so it's easy to answer. I don't need, even though there's a grammatical mistake, the meaning is clear, okay? Whereas if I said to someone, oh, can you please pass me the book? 
and actually I meant pass me the pen, then, you know, communication breaks down, you know, so that's a vocab mistake. So, yeah, it's clear here that uh, not always, but often a grammatical mistake, the meaning can still be interpreted. Right? Also, going back to Lexis, the, a lot of people say, uh, if you've ever been to one of Vaughan Jones' excellent presentations when he's talking about focus around the country, he's really hammered home that 3,000 uh, word families are very important to get to like a strong B1 level of English, you know? So, um, yeah, I mean, when we're talking about word families, we're not talking about words here. So if you're thinking about the word like convenient, you would also include in that family convenience, inconvenient, inconvenience, you know, conveniently, inconveniently. That's the example of one family, okay? But yeah, so we often, do, we often talk about words. To understand the text, it's very important that you understand the words generally. You know, we can teach you little techniques in the classroom for how to, you know, maybe guess the meaning from the context. But actually, if you don't know the word, it's difficult to understand the text. If you've ever done an international exam, such as IELTS, whoa, the reading is tough if you don't know the, what the words mean sometimes, you know? So to understand 90, 95% of a text, they say that again, 3,000 word families is important. I believe it gets up to 5,000 for B2 level. OK, so again, vocab is very important. We haven't even mentioned grammar when it comes to understanding a text very much. You know, also, we have a beautiful graph here. Now, this is a graph about learning English. As you can see on the left there, there is the beginner's slope. OK, so when you learn uh, English at the beginning, hopefully, if you do your homework and what the teacher tells you, um, and you maybe do a little bit of work outside the classroom, you start to learn pretty quickly. Yeah, so um, yeah, beginner's level, elementary, even pre-intermediate, you're thinking, oh, this is all right, this isn't bad. That's why it's nice as a teacher to teach lower levels sometimes because you see the progress quite quickly, you know. But when you hit intermediate level or upper intermediate level, progress maybe, well, usually uh, slows down, okay, because... Uh, you hit what is called the intermediate plateau, okay, where the, uh, the speed of uh, learning, it's sort of a pretty natural thing, just slows down a lot. You get frustrated, perhaps, and then you drop out because you think you're not learning quick enough. Um, and maybe the teacher of this level gets a bit frustrated as well, you know. So the intermediate plateau is a very important part that most learners experience, perhaps at upper intermediate uh, beginning of upper intermediate, um, but it's a frustrating time. Now, they do say in terms of Lexis um, that what uh, when you hit the intermediate or upper intermediate plateau um, or the, the B1 plateau, uh, B1 plus plateau, what's important here is learning more Lexis and learning more collocations, what you can do with the Lexis, okay? By this point, when you've reached the end of intermediate, you've probably learned most of the grammatical structures. Of course, you, you're not using them completely accurately, um, but they are more like slips when you make mistake rather than an error. So that's what they say, more words from this point onwards and what to do with the words is important. Okay, so the, to, to beat the plateau, if you like, um, then you have to learn more words, more collocations, more phrases. Okay. Um, now, moving on. Now, so some of you, I'm sure most of you, will be aware of the terminology here, subordinate clause, auxiliary verb, present perfect passive, et cetera, et cetera. When I came into teaching, of course, they were as confusing for me as they were for my learners. Now, do you think these, uh, what, ah, uh -huh, my next question, what is the terminology related to? Of course, yeah, a lot of you are putting grammar. Now, we're not going to go into detail about the subjunctive, Goodness me, we haven't got enough time. Uh, but yeah, you're right. They are all connected to grammar, okay? And uh, most of us and our students are pretty comfortable with these, uh, with this terminology. Now, the lexical approach brought in a whole different range of terminology. If you look at this, okay? So again, I'm gonna give you a couple of minutes. Can you please write what, I've already mentioned one or two of these. Can you write what these uh, phrases mean? Collocations, excellent. Fixed phrase, lexical chunk, whoa. Sentence structure, yeah, the last one is quite tricky. It's not sentence structure, although I can see why you put that. 
Sentence stress. Mm, sentence structure. Semi fixed. Excellent. Fixed. Oh, stem. Who put that? Fantastic. Well done. Okay. Sentence stem. Yeah. Okay. Style. So let's have a look. So, yeah, collocation, as a lot of you put, uh, fixed phrase, lexical chunk semi-fixed expression and sentence stem as a few of you managed to get there well done if you got that that was probably it's probably the rarest one out of the lot of them okay so these are all the new vocab the new terminology that came in that is starting to come into course books more and more as well okay now let's look at them one by one to check we know what they mean and why they are useful for the lexical approach so uh, just before we get to that just to tell you that a chunk is actually the umbrella term for all of the other expressions. So you can say a fixed expression, a collocation, they're all part of a lexical chunk, okay? So if you're not sure, just say it's a lexical chunk, okay? All right, so now let's look at collocations first. What are they? Tell me what collocations are. How can you define what is a collocation? Combinations, good, good answer. Anything else? Words used together. Fantastic. Family words. Uh huh. Phrases. Phrases. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Word partnerships. Words that go together. Partnerships. Like it. Uh huh. Word friends. I love that expression. Yes. Uh, idioms. Sometimes they are. Mm hmm. Okay. All right. So let's have a look. Right. Yeah. Word partnerships. Or friends, as, I, as I've already said. Usually two words could be more, could be three. I think four is pushing it a bit, but they occasionally are, are, are three, especially if you include the article. Yeah, so words that go together, word partnerships. Okay, let's have a look at um, a few examples here. So we've got make a decision. Okay, obviously we've got a verb noun here. Of course, you could put come to a decision, reach a decision, take a decision. Okay, all of them good verbs. Decision is very flexible. Um, take a break, have a break, for example. A totally awesome, so we have their um, uh, very American uh, um, collocation with an adverb and an adjective, okay? Uh, British people maybe would say absolutely fantastic, okay? But Americans like to use this word awesome. A golden opportunity, very nice phrase there, and a heavy smoker. As we can see, um, this, um, we also could include the article as part of the collocation in many ways. It is, you know, you golden opportunity usually be, comes with the article. Yeah, so a golden opportunity perhaps, yeah. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Fixed phrases. I think we know, but what are they? Tell me what you think. A chain smoker, very good um, collocation there. Yeah, but what's a fixed phrase then? Idioms, good, yeah. Uh, not always, but often, yeah, cannot change. Yeah, we cannot change any idioms. Fantastic, stable, good, uh -huh. idioms, idioms. Words cannot be changed, idioms. Fantastic answers, guys, well done. Okay, let's have a look then. So yeah, what I've called them is self-contained expressions. So they are, you know, part, they are just, you can't change them, basically, yeah. Uh, they are fixed, as in the name tells you. So includes idiomatic expressions, as a lot of you mentioned. Let's have a look here. So um, as we can see, that the poor cats. But yeah, there's more than one way to skin a cat. So the meaning that there's more than one way to do something. Uh, one of my favorite uh, idioms. Uh, of course, if you change cat to dog, it just wouldn't make sense. There's more than one way to skin a dog. Nobody says that unless you're trying to be amusing. Um, but yeah, so yeah, it's um, yeah, it's it's um, it's a good example of an idiom, a fixed phrase that you can't change. Okay, uh, by and large, again, okay, you, I can't. It's sort of the meaning of on the whole or in general. Again, I'm not sure you could change either of the words. This one is a good example, actually, of what um, of what we call a binomial. So in in English, we have a lot of these expressions, the three words with the middle always and or sometimes or okay so we have uh we can't change the words and we can't change the order of the words you know so by and large we can't say large and by okay uh and uh, another good example is fish and chips uh british people never say chips and fish 
which is, you would look a bit strange if you said that. Uh, now and then, good. You can't say then and now. That's very good. Okay. Um, yeah, and also you would, yeah, knife and fork. In English, we very rarely say fork and knife. Pass me the fork and knife. Nobody would say that, you know. So, again, these uh, very interesting binomials. Black and white, yeah, we don't say white and black, you know. Um, so that's a good a good was yeah good expression okay and we have the last one here I beg to differ again a fixed phrase is a very polite and slightly old-fashioned way of saying I disagree but again we can't really change any of the words here okay all right moving on now if those were fixed what do you think about semi-fix then what are they I'm sure it's easy to work out Mm -hmm. So, semi-fixed expressions, what are they? Can be changed, yeah? One component can be changed. Some changes can be possible, yeah? Changeable, changeable, very good, yeah? Uh -huh. Excellent, yeah. So, something can be changed. Not all of it, but some of it, hence the word semi-fixed, okay? Um, so. Okay, yeah, they are like fixed expressions, but with slots, which can have many fillers. So if you have one word is a, like a slot, and you can change that word according to the situation, if you want to sound more polite or less polite, for example. Yeah. So uh, we've got, um, for example, pleased to meet you, okay, which we could change. Uh, we could change pleased to meet you to pleased to see you, for example. Uh-huh. Uh, we could say glad to meet you. So that's a very good expression of a semi-fixed, a very good example of a semi-fixed expression. Yeah. Okay. Give me a bell also. It's a good example. Yeah, quite, idi quite uh, idiomatic in many ways, quite slang. Give me a call, give me a ring. Fantastic examples there. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I regret to inform you that you never want to hear this because it's always going to be bad news. What can you say instead of regret or inform? Sorry. Good. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry to inform you that. Okay. Uh -huh. Or I regret to tell you that. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, as you can see. Okay. These are all good examples of semi-fixed expressions. Yeah, fantastic. Okay. Now, moving on to the, the last, but by no means least one, a sentence stem. Now, I've put this picture in the stem of a plant, as you can see, to help you. Uh, any idea what a sentence stem is? Has anybody got any views on this? Structure, yeah, it's connected to structure, good. Key part, word order, uh-huh. Fixed word order, okay, uh -huh. Subject and predicates, wow, good terminology. Uh -huh. um, word order, word order. Beginnings of questions, possibly. Very good. Structure. Okay, so they are basically. One second. Oops, we have frozen a little bit. Uh -huh. One second. Ooh. Okay, yes, we're the beginnings of sentences. Okay, as somebody put the beginnings of questions, so they're similar to functional language. If you've ever taught functional language, so the language you need to communicate usually, there are lots of sentence stems in this. So, for example, okay, again, we are sticking a little bit here. Huh? Just be patient with me, please. The slides are a little bit sticky today. Huh? Mm -hmm. Your internet working there? Uh, my thing's just gone off. I don't think it's computers, guy. I think it might be something to do with the um, the program. Yeah, I think it's yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the I don't connection problem. 
please check your internet connection. <laughs> We're back on. <laughs> so good job I didn't use any bad language there. I hope. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> back to back to. <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. You know. Okay. So um, yeah, sentence stems going straight back to it. Similar to functional language. So if you look at these, we have got. Um, Would you mind if I? <laughs> Or could you tell me, I was wondering if so, the beginnings of sentence, the stem of a sentence is like the beginning. They're pretty fixed or semi-fixed. Okay, I have no idea what happened, guys. But anyway, the good news is we're back, you know. Um, so, yeah, the good news is, um, yeah. So, okay, moving on from sentence steps. So, just an example here of, um, of uh, an expression, uh, a, a good fixed phrase or lexical chunk, okay. Now, can anyone guess? what the word is in the uh, in the gap there you know fruit freak <laughs> good guesses fantasy very good uh -huh. thing oh thing very close fantasy form fear uh -huh. okay oh, oh, oh. Uh, you're all pretty close i think one person got it just a figment of your imagination, okay? Uh, now, just a figment, what does it actually, now, the, just a figment of your imagination is basically when you say to someone, you are imagining it, you know? It's just in your mind, yeah? Like, um, if you think, uh, I don't know, a husband might say to a wife, if she says, you know, you've been to the pub every day this week, and he says, no, I haven't, it's just a figment of your imagination, yeah? You're just imagining. But what does the word figment actually mean you know that just the one word figment anybody know it's, it's quite a tricky one fantasy possibly yeah uh -huh. now yeah figment um actually i didn't know actually what it meant myself so i looked it up before this uh, webinar and a fig a figment is a thing that someone believes to be real but exists only in their imagination Okay, now I didn't know that because we never use this word figment by itself. We always use it in this phrase. So it's a good example of a phrase, a lexical chunk that you should teach and learners should learn as a fixed phrase, as one phrase. Okay, because you don't need to know the word figment actually. Okay, it's like I always tell uh, people that when I learned uh, Polish, when I first was in Poland with the dinosaurs, and I was saying, um, and I used to say, you know, the yak shamash, how are you to everyone? But I didn't know what yak or shamash meant. I just learned the whole phrase. It was only later that I understood yak was how and shamash was like a reflexive version of to have or something like that, you know? Okay, so uh, moving on, okay. Um, we're going to go on to the lexical approach, okay? So we've got all these collocations, sentence stems, etc., etc. Okay, in the and we're talking about the, the in the classroom, but okay, how do we implement this in the classroom? How do we actually use it in the classroom? Well, I've got a few ideas, a few tips. My first one is uh, use the whiteboard. Now, if you're teaching a lot of Lexis, as the lexical approach preaches, you've got to use the whiteboard um, quite often. Okay, so for example, you write the new word. Uh, on the board, but you don't just write the word, you can write it in a whole phrase or a whole sentence if you have room for the board, the whiteboard or the smart board or the blackboard or whatever you're using. For example, if you are teaching uh, dropped out of, um, uh, in your a class TV, looking at education vocabulary, you can write he dropped out of university because he had missed a lot of lectures. Now, the advantages of this is one advantage might be that the students are less tempted to write the full translation in their notebooks, but also when the students get home, they can open their notebooks, look at what they learned, and they've got the full sentence in the context, so they immediately understand what it means, okay? So writing that, if you have room, the problem with the lexical approach, your board becomes very full 
quite quickly, yeah? You need a, a big whiteboard or several whiteboards, perhaps, okay? Now, on that topic, as I said, encourage your students to do good note-taking, okay? I don't know, but I'm not a big fan of students taking photos of the board at the end of the class, you know? Um, usually because my board is a bit messy, um, but also because, um, you know, are they really going to go home and look at the photos. That's why I try and encourage my students and students to take down what's exactly what's on the whiteboard, which is a good reason to write the language in a context. Okay. Also, um, exposure. We talked about this. So exposure is basically contact with the language, and it always encourage students. Uh, to do a lot of reading outside the classroom and a lot of listening if possible. I always tell students to listen to what you're interested in. So if you're interested in football, listen to something in English on football, for example, you know. And um, songs are particularly good for this because songs have a lot of collocations, fixed phrases, semi-fixed phrases, phrasal verbs, all sorts of good things with Lexis. Of course, occasionally, it doesn't make much sense. I have students saying, what does this mean? And I say, I really don't know. You know, it's a very strange, it's not part of British English, you know, but still there's a lot of good stuff in songs, you know. And also, um, as teachers, we should, I believe, be recycling and reviewing the Lexis as much as possible. Good books do this, but I think we need to do it ourselves as well, because um, they do say that a, a student should have contact with a new word or phrase uh, six times, I think I heard, before that word uh, or phrase is acquired, you know? So not just once or twice, but six times, you know? So they need to see it, use it, write it, you know, and then use it again before it actually becomes part of their active vocabulary, okay? All right, so the lexical approach, guys. Can we use it when we teach? What do you think? For sure. Good answer. Lots of pluses. Excellent. Agree. Good. Yeah. <laughs> definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Sure. Yep. Yeah. Uh-huh. Good. 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 Okay. All right. So, yes, you've got the same answer as me. Okay. Which is good. So we can definitely use it when we teach. Okay. Now, the problem was, okay, when I, when I started teaching, uh, whoops, we had this. Do you remember this from the beginning of the presentation? So we had this and it was difficult to use the lexical approach with individual words and no context. Okay. But these days we have better books. For example, the new book from Pearson's Roadmap. Okay. I'm going to show you a few things that they do uh, with collocations, with fixed phrases, you know, to show you how the teaching of Lexis and the presentation of Lexis has improved. Uh, over the last 20 years and is getting better and better, okay? So if we have a look at a typical unit here, unit 3B, um, as you can see straight away, it's much nicer on the eye. We have pictures to present the context. We have vocabulary. We have practice, okay? And we also have the heading, catching up, which introduces the topic of the vocabulary. What is catching up? If you catch up with someone, what do you do exactly? So if I say to someone, let's catch up next week, what am I doing? Ah, find out what you've missed, know about recent news. Okay, good, hang out, exchange news, fantastic, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, so, yeah, if we say let's catch up, it's, yeah, basically let's find out about news that we've both missed uh, in the last few months or something like that, okay? Um, now, also, as you can see here, we have the language presented in a context and language, the target language, is highlighted for you, okay? So take a minute just to read through these four paragraphs and which experience, one, two, three, or four, is similar to your experience at the moment? One and two, one, yeah, me too, I think, unfortunately. Four, three, uh -huh. one, 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 four. Uh -huh. Not many twos. Uh -huh. People don't like to spend time with colleagues, it seems, you know. Um, 
Mm -hmm. Fours and ones, yes, I know what you mean. At the moment, especially, it's difficult to get to know new people, of course. Only online, lockdown, yeah. Somebody's put all four, good. Okay, so you see, in, uh, in Roadmap, they give you a chance to react to the, to the paragraphs, to the phrases, before uh, we analyze the phrases in more detail. So, which phrases in bold do you remember now? Uh -huh. Guys, I know I was a bit mean. I didn't tell you to look exactly, but I'll give you just a quick look now. Uh -huh. Again. All right. Okay. Have a quick look at that. Uh -huh. It's like a test. Uh -huh. And then we've got the practice part. Okay. So uh, we go from the presentation straight to the practice. Now, as you can see, I'm not going to look at all of them, but we're going to look at four. So the first one, how do you keep in touch with friends and family? Okay. What about two, three, and four, guys? Write in your answers. What are the missing words here? Get on, good. Get on, get along, it could be, yeah, meet, uh-huh. Get on, get on, get on. Okay, all right, uh-huh, very good. Now let's have a look. So, keep in touch, get on well, keep in touch again, got to know, uh-huh, lost touch, and meet up. Guys, you did fantastic there, well done, okay? Now, of course, in the classroom, we would then perhaps do a mingling activity or perhaps a pair work activity where we ask questions to our partners or our classmates. Unfortunately, we can't do that on a webinar, uh, but we can dream about it, I suppose, you know? Okay, so uh, as you can see there in, the, in this edition of Roadmap, we have context from the pictures, from the paragraphs, chunks of language, not individual words, and personalized productive activities. People are talking about themselves, okay? So that's uh, the good elements of that um, page. We're going to look at a couple more. Okay, so again, we have a page. This one's from the B2 book, so slightly higher level. And we have, again, the, the heading splashing out. What do you do if you splash out on something? Can anybody tell me? Ah, spend a lot of money. Uh -huh. Spending too much. Well, yeah, usually spend a lot of money. Good. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Spend a lot of money. Yeah. Money. Spending too much. Good. Yeah. So you can splash out on a new computer, splash out on a new suit, you know, splash out on a new car or a new house if you've got lots of money. So, yeah, spend a lot of money. So, again, immediately you know from the pictures and from the heading that it's going to be about money, okay? So we're going to look at this exercise this time, as you can see here. Just take a minute to read about these two people and their spending habits. Okay, now I hope you have noticed, because we're going to look a bit at noticing, I hope you have noticed some of the nouns and some of the prepositions that are highlighted here. Okay, now can you remember what the word missing words are here? Debt, looking good, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah, get into debt. Take out. Fantastic. Okay. Uh huh. Take out. Fantastic. Yeah. And aside. Yes. Excellent. Okay. So set aside. So, uh huh. There, as you can see, get into debt, take out, and set aside. Okay. So this was all examples of I was asking you to notice the language there. Okay. Which nouns or which prepositions go with which verbs. Okay. Well done, everyone. So, again, a good example of newish techniques used for teaching Lexis, all right? Now, if we have a look at the final one, this one's a little bit different, okay? Because this one looks at the functional language. And as you can see here, we have some sentence stems, the beginning of language with the continuation in brackets, yeah? So, 
So this is all about asking someone to do something or responding to requests, okay? Now, these are all semi-fixed, the majority of them, as a lot of functional language or sentence stems are. Now, what can you replace the words that I've circled with? What different words can you use with these semi-fixed expressions? Can, excellent. Uh -huh. Good. May. May, perhaps may. Uh -huh. Good, can, do, yeah, instead of would, we've got do, good. Uh -huh. Would you mind? Sorry, good, yeah. So, yeah, instead of could, we could say, can you help me? Of course, can is maybe more with friends or family because it's less polite. We use could, the past tense, when we want to have a distance with the learner. So could is usually the more polite option there. Could you help me? Maybe someone you don't know. Can you help me? Uh, maybe, a, you know, a friend or relative. Again, would you mind looking after my rabbit? Very polite. Okay, again, past tense used because we want to be polite and keep a social distance. You could say, do you mind? If it's more with someone you know. Okay, and then I'm afraid, very formal. Again, maybe on the telephone you would use this, or maybe someone giving you bad news. But of course, we could also use, I'm sorry, okay? I'm sorry I can't do that, okay? So good examples here of uh, semi-fixed phrases that you could change according to politeness, uh, sentence stems. And we have good example here, as you can see on the slide, of role plays, okay? So the, I, I love role plays. I hope one day I can do a seminar or a webinar on role plays. And uh, yeah, role plays very useful with sentence stems, with semi-fixed expressions, and the students have plenty of practice using this language, okay? All right, so that was a little bit about what I think is a fantastic book uh, for teaching Lexis. Let's just look at a few classroom tips. I like to finish my webinars with some practical tips that could help you in the classroom. Yeah? The first one is, yeah, always model and drill new Lexis with the students, okay? This will help them remember it. So I always tell the teachers, like, don't forget, if you've got new Lexis, uh, model it, so do it yourself, or maybe with the CD, um, and then drill it, okay? Um, so say it and get the students to repeat it after you. Now, not only does this help with the pronunciation, this will also help the students to remember that phrase. For me personally, when I'm learning new words in a new language, I like to say them aloud. It helps me to remember them, okay? So yeah, drilling is good for prawn, but also for good for memorization, okay? And students enjoy it, I always think. Any level, I, I, and you can do it uh, in Zoom lessons as well. It's not impossible. Slight delay sometimes, but it is possible to do drilling uh, online with online teaching too. Okay, um, connected to uh, drilling, uh, I would also say don't forget when you're teaching new Lexis, drill the whole phrase, not just individual words. Okay, remember, as I said before, we don't speak in individual words, so the students should repeat the phrase or the word in a phrase. So, for example, if it's decision, you could start with decision and then come to a decision and then perhaps the whole phrase. It's difficult to come to a decision, okay? Because that is what somebody would say in real life, okay? And you could even decision, come to a decision, difficult to come to a decision. It's difficult to come to a decision. Getting the students to repeat more and more each time, paying attention to the weak forms, come to, come to a decision, difficult to come to a decision, you know? So I love this type of drilling, what we call chain drilling, okay? And it's really useful to drill the whole phrase, I would say. Okay. Also, um, with Lexis, not only with grammar, but with Lexis, give the students a chance to do a controlled written exercise, for example, a gap fill with the new Lexis before they use it orally. Okay. So um, this will help them consolidate the meaning of the Lexis. Students need time to think about it, to consolidate it. You've got your presentation, your drilling but the students need control practice before they then use it. There's no point getting them to use it orally if they haven't understood what the phrase or word means, okay? So, yeah, controlled written and then oral practice after that, okay? That's what I suggest anyway, okay? 
All right. So in general, just to summarize the lexical approach, Lexis is just as important as grammar. I'm not going to say if it's more important. There's still a lot of grammarians out there, and I love teaching grammar myself, okay? So, but it is just as important, you know, at least just as important, okay? Course book coverage of Lexis since the dinosaurs were roaming Poland and bothering me on the streets. Uh, course book coverage of Lexis has improved greatly. That's the good news, okay? They have a lot of good exercises in them already. Connected to um, connected to language roadmap is a very good example. Okay, and when you teach a word, teach it with its friends. Don't just teach it alone. Remember the word decision. Its friend is make. Its friend is take. Its friend is come to. Okay, so all of these um, words you have to teach. Put it on the whiteboard. Get the students to write it down with its friends. Okay. All right, so guys, that brings me to almost the end of my webinar. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm really sorry about the strange things happening in the background. I really hope I didn't use any, any bad language because I couldn't see you, but you could see me apparently. Um, so don't forget that your certificate will be coming to you anytime in the next week. It'll be in a few days, I hope, but give it a week. Okay, um, yeah, so that'll be coming soon. Okay, um, I will be back in two weeks, going to be talking about Speak Out and the, the main features and benefits and how you can use that in the classroom. Okay, Speak Out, uh, yeah, so I hope you will join me then. Registration should open soon, so that will be great. Great to see you all again. Um, also, finally, uh, my lovely colleague, Mariana, in one hour and seven minutes, she'll be on Facebook um, doing internal education live. She'll be, she's an expert on young learners. She helped write, uh, she was a co-author of Fly High Ukrainian version. She knows a lot about young learners and teaching young learners, much more than I do. And she'll be um, talking about teaching young learners, answering your questions. And also she'll be talking about ways to start a young learner lesson and not only face-to-face, um, um, -face, but how these ways can work online, because we're all teaching online, me included at the moment, okay? So, thank you very much once again, guys. You've been a fantastic audience, as usual. Fantastic knowledge, very friendly. Great that I know all about the weather that's going on all over Ukraine. It's still sunny here at the moment. I hope you get some good weather uh, for the long weekend. I hope you have a great May Day tomorrow. and. Um, yeah, uh, I really hope you can use some of these advice and I really uh, recommend Roadmap as a book. And yeah, guys, fantastic. Have a great weekend. Stay safe, stay healthy. Um, and I'll see you all, I really hope, in two weeks, okay? All right, ciao, everyone. Bye-bye, bye-bye. Okay, see you soon. Bye-bye.